Muchísimas gracias. Um, I'll be speaking to you using language, using English. But language uh, I will be using because it's a thing I can do. It's a thing we all can do. It's this special human trick that we have. I can take ideas from my mind and place them in your mind. We can transmit ideas across vast reaches of time and space, right? So I can construct a new idea in my mind right now and pass it to you. I can say, imagine a penguin playing the piano while it's flying in a spaceship that is shaped like an empanada. But the empanada has legs. If everything has gone relatively well in your life so far, you haven't had that thought before, right? I've just given you a new thought, a new idea. And I did this using this very strange mechanism. So as I'm talking right now, my mouth is creating airwaves. I'm making hisses and tones and puffs with my mouth. That's creating airwaves. Those pressure waves in the air are traveling to your ears. They're impinging on your eardrums. And then your brain takes that pattern of vibration from your eardrums and transforms that pattern into thoughts. I hope. I hope that's happening. Right. Now, that is an incredibly powerful tool not just for transmitting thoughts, but also for creating new thoughts, right? We can infinitely recombine words to create new ideas. And what's more, there's not just one language, obviously, spoken in the world. There are about 7,000 languages spoken. Um, and all of these languages differ from each other in what they require of their speakers. And people have been offering opinions on the topic of whether language shapes the way we think for a long time. So, for example, Charlemagne said, to have a second language is to have a second soul. Uh, Charles V said, um, a man who knows four languages is worth four men. Something to consider if you speak lots of languages, you can go to your boss and say, hey, I need a raise, I'm worth four employees. Um, so this question of whether language shapes thought has been around for thousands of years, but recently, in the last 30 years or so, there's finally been scientific evidence that shows the way that languages, structures and languages actually shape the way that we think. Let me give you some of my favorite examples of this. I'll start with how people think about space. So what you see here are some uh, folks that I had a chance to work with. They live in a remote uh, place in Australia. They're an Aboriginal group in Australia. They're the Kuktair people. And the reason I was interested to go there is that in Kuktair and in many languages around the world, they don't use words like left and right to describe space. Instead, everything is in terms of cardinal directions for them, north, south, east, west, and then the intermediate directions. Now, when I say everything, I really mean everything. So the way you say hello in Kuktair, in English we say, how are you? Fine. In Kuktair you say, which way are you going? And the answer should be something like, north, northwest, in the far distance, how about you? So imagine as you're walking around your daily life, every time you say hi to someone, you have to report your heading direction. Well, at first, of course, it would be very hard, because probably most of the time you don't know which way you're heading. In fact, let's do the experiment right now. Um, please close your eyes. So everyone close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, point southeast. OK, you can open your eyes. I see, I see points in all directions. Uh, I don't know which way it is myself. You guys haven't been very helpful. Um, don't feel bad. This is very, very normal. Uh, in a lot of communities in the, in the West, this is, this is just, even if people have been coming to the same theater to hear talks for 40 years, they can't point southeast. It's completely normal, except in communities like this where I could ask a five-year-old, can you point southeast? And she will point immediately without hesitation. And of course, I'll need to check my compass to make sure that she's correct. Now, 
people in communities like this, because of the languages that they speak, orient incredibly well. In fact, they orient better than we used to think humans could. So we used to think humans can't orient um, like ants or like salmon or like certain types of birds because we don't have the biological adaptations that these other creatures have. So we used to say, well, we don't have magnets in our beaks or in our scales. Uh, biologically, we are impaired from being able to orient as well as these other creatures. Turns out, there's nothing wrong with the human brain. The human brain is able to orient just as well. It's just a matter of cultural practice. And to me, this example is so fascinating because it was something that was believed in the scientific community to be impossible for the human mind. It turns out it's not just not impossible, it's, it's not even that hard. Like, you could just try for a week and get pretty good at it. Right? So we just never even thought to try uh, because what were we, what, it was what we were used to is to not be able to orient. Whereas in these communities, they're used to something else. Now, uh, people don't just differ in how they think about space, they also differ in how they think about time. So uh, here's a simple example. Suppose I take these cards, I uh, shuffle them, put them in a random order, give them to you and say, lay them out so that they're in the correct order. These happen to be pictures of my grandfather at different ages. Now, most people who read and write uh, languages like English or Spanish will lay the cards out like this, from left to right. Earlier on the left, later on the right. But if you read and write a language like Hebrew or Arabic that is written from right to left, then you would lay the cards out in the other direction, with the oldest man on the left and the youngest man on the right. Now, what about people in communities like I just told you about who don't use left and right? What would they do? Well, let me give you a hint. If we sit uh, the kuktair down facing south, they lay the cards out from left to right. If, them, if we sit them facing north, they'll lay the cards out from right to left. If the, we sit them facing, uh, facing east, they'll lay the cards out coming towards the body. The pattern, it's from east to west, the direction of the sun. And that's not the only way that time can go in these communities. Sometimes it flows down river, sometimes it goes downhill. Depending on what's important in the culture, that can be the organizing principle for time. Another example, we used to think that the future had to be in front, that, people, that all humans must think of the future as ahead of them and the past behind them. That's the way we talk in a lot of European languages. The best is ahead, the worst is behind. It's the way we move our bodies. So, oh, I'm looking forward to that, or that was a long time ago. That turns out also not to be necessary. In some communities, like the Aymara, uh, a language spoken here in Chile and also in Bolivia, they put the past in front and the future behind. And for them, it's extremely obvious why you would do that. The future is unknown. That's why you can't see it. The past has already happened. That's what you're looking at it. So to them, it seems extremely strange that you would have the future in front of you. How presumptive. You don't know what the future holds. You haven't seen it yet. That's why it's behind your, it should be behind your head. Here's another really clever human trick. If I ask you, how many penguins are there? All of you can give me an answer. And I can guess how most of you got the answer is in whatever language you count, you went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You used a trick, you used the count list that you memorized as a child, all the number words in order, and you named each one with a successive number word. And then when you had named all of them, the last word that you said was the number, right? We learn this trick uh, as children, we take it completely for granted. We think that we just know how to do this naturally. Well, it took humans thousands of years to develop the idea of exact numbers, to develop the kind of number systems we have, uh, to develop this ability to be able to keep track of exact quantities. And different linguistic communities developed different ones. So some languages count in base 10, which makes sense, or base 5, or base 20, if, you, if your toes are available. Um, 
But there are other body-based systems that are base 27, where you might include the forearm and the elbow and the shoulder and the top of the head. Um, the biggest base I know is base 81. That's a language spoken in Papua New Guinea. But there are also languages that never develop number words. And so if uh, you give a speaker of one of those languages a task like this, they could approximate, and, you know, if I say, can you lay out a number of stones that's the same as the number of penguins, they could get it approximately right, but not exactly right, because they don't have this trick of being able to count. And that's a small stepping stone, just having these number words, a small stepping stone into a whole realm of thinking. Language is also different in how they divide up the visual world. So, for example, how we think about colors. Uh, some languages have only two words for colors, light and dark. Some have lots of uh, words for colors. Where languages put boundaries between colors can differ. So, for example, in Russian, there's an obligatory distinction between light blue and dark blue. So there's not a single word that covers everything that English calls blue. There's one word, globoy, for sini, uh, another word, um, uh, one word, globoy, for light blue, and then another word, sini, for dark blue. Now, when we test Russian speakers and English speakers on their ability to discriminate these colors, Russian speakers are faster to tell the difference between colors that are in different language categories for them. So if they would call them by different names, they appear perceptually to be more different to them than if they would call them by the same name. Of course, for English speakers, they're all blue. So this is an example of language reaching in very early on in the cognitive process, shaping even how you tell the difference between two shades of blue. Here's another, one of my favorite quirks of language. Uh, of course, you know languages have grammatical gender. In Spanish, all nouns are masculine or feminine. Um, and these grammatical genders, they frustrate people who try to learn uh, languages uh, with you know, new to them grammatical genders. Uh, so uh, Mark Twain wrote an essay about learning German where he complained mostly about the grammatical gender system. And the name of the essay was The Awful German Language. Um, David Sedaris writes about learning French and he gets so frustrated not knowing the genders of words that he starts to referring to everything in the plural because you don't have to mark gender in the plural in French. And so then he always has to buy two toasters and two loaves of bread, just so he doesn't give away to the shopkeeper that he doesn't know the gender. Now, these genders differ across languages. Uh, so, for example, the moon is masculine in German, feminine in Spanish, the sun is the reverse. And it turns out people actually ascribe masculine and feminine properties to these things, even though they're not humans, they're not biological, but people will say things are beautiful, elegant, if the word for uh, that object is feminine in the language. And then they'll say it's strong or towering if the word for that object is masculine in the language. So even this little quirk can affect how people think. What's impressive about that is that grammatical gender applies to all nouns. So it's language shaping how you think about anything that can be named by a noun. What can be named by a noun? Just about everything, right? Uh, so it's an incredibly broad scope of influence. Here's another example. Languages differ in how they describe events. And this is a line of research in my lab that actually started here in Santiago. I had a student who was studying here for a year. And when she came back, she said, well, my Spanish got pretty good, but there's one mistake I constantly make. And that is when I'm talking about events, especially accidents, I use the form that I would use in English. I say, I lost the library book. I broke the vase, even if it's an accident. And in Spanish, you wouldn't say that. You would use, you would use a, a sentence starting with se. So if uh, uh, this happened, you might say, se me cayó, se me rompió, right? Uh, whereas in English, you would say, he broke the vase, right? In English, we can even say, I broke my arm. Uh, lots of languages don't allow you to say that unless you're a lunatic and you tried to break your arm and you succeeded. 
Uh, and in fact, we find differences between English and Spanish speakers where English speakers pay more attention to who did it, even if it's an accident, whereas Spanish speakers are more attentive to whether or not it was an accident, because in Spanish you would describe it differently if it was an accident than if it was an intentional event. So I've given you a few examples of how the languages we speak shape the way we think. Uh, big differences, deep differences, early influences of language, uh, really broad effects like in grammatical gender, and language shaping how we think about weighty matters like blame and punishment, responsibility. I want to leave you with a few thoughts. The fact that there is not just one language but 7,000 means that there are 7,000 different realities that humans have invented. And that's an incredible testament to the ingenuity and flexibility of the human mind. We're able to create so many realities and we can create many more because languages are living things. They're tools that we have created and they're tools that we continue to change and hone to suit our needs. One problem for science is that almost all science of the mind so far has been based on usually English speakers, usually students at North American universities. And so almost everything that we know about, quote unquote, the human mind excludes almost all humans, right? Um, and as scientists, we have to do better. We have to understand, to, if we were going to have a rigorous study of the mind, we have to really embrace the human mind and all of its richness and diversity the way it exists around the world. Because language is such a productive tool for cognition, there's also something for you to take away and to think about actively, right? So you, have, you carry around with you this incredibly flexible, creative tool where you can create infinite new ideas. Those new ideas can then create the kind of world that you want to live in, right? We don't have to be stuck with things the way that they are. Things have always changed and they will continue to change. And language is one tool that you can use to make the thoughts you want to have, make the thoughts that you want to communicate to other people that you want them to have. So as you leave here today, think, what is the world that I would want to live in how would I describe that world? How would I change the way that I talk so that I can live in that world and make that world for the next generation? Thank you very much.